Welcome everybody. This is Luke Alvarez speaking. I'm the founding and managing partner of Hero Capital. Uh, we're a venture capital fund focused on the game space and some other sectors that I'll describe in a second. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is what, as a VC firm, we look for in a game studio. Uh, we look at thousands of opportunities annually, at least a couple of thousand. Um, and we invest in about 1% of what we see. Um, so this is to give you an idea of what we're looking for when we talk to a studio um, and also what we care about as a fund and as people and, and how we can help you. Next slide. So as Hero Capital, we're uh, a, a professional venture capital investor and we invest in great studios making amazing content. And we also invest in technology in and around the game space. And we actually invest in three sectors. Games and game studios is about half of what we invest in. And in this fund, we've made uh, two studio investments, actually now three so far. And we're gonna do another 10 or so over the course of the next 12 months. So um, within between 2020 and 2021, we should have invested in somewhere between 12 and 15 game studios, mostly in UK and Europe, uh, a few in the US. And we also invest in games technology and in technologies around esports and game streaming, and also in the gamification of digital sports and fitness. And you may know well that get products and technologies like Zwift and others are built in games uh, platforms and technologies and we see a big convergence between gameplay and the gamification of real world sports and fitness but today our focus is talking about games and we invest in these sectors fundamentally because we think they're the future and we think that what you do as entrepreneurs and as game studio innovators is you are building components and pillars of the future and you're right at the kind of hot intersection of some of the most exciting trends in uh, human societies, in consumer uh, appetites and in the emergence of new technologies. Next slide. So why do we believe this? Fundamentally, uh, we think that uh, if you go back to the 1970s, very much the first computers that most general consumers and people and humans interacted with outside government laboratories and huge businesses and military institutions um, were games machines in arcades. The Pong machine was the first computer I ever hit as a kid, in, I ever touched as a kid uh, in the 70s. Um, in the 80s, most people's first home computer uh, was an Atari or a Commodore 64 uh, before they got an Apple Macintosh or uh, an IBM Microsoft PC. Um, in the noughties, many of the first apps that we downloaded, and even before the apps, the first things we did on our phones other than talking and texting on them were playing uh, early games. Um, from the app stores and before the app stores on, on WAP and so on and so forth. Um, and amazing technology companies like NVIDIA, um, which are now taking over the world, buying the biggest chip companies in the world, making the smartest and most powerful data center machine learning AI chipsets, started as companies making tech for the games industry. Um, so we believe that in many ways, games are the place and the ecosystem where new technologies um, uh, hit the consumer market first. And what gamers are doing today, um, everybody will be doing in a few years time. Gamers and games companies often create the technologies and the experiences that become the experiences for the mass market later. We are the early adopters. Um, and we think we're at the middle of a really interesting phase in the industry. We had a huge growth phase in the 70s and 80s, driven by arcades and then home consoles. Um, we had a big growth phase in the 90s and the noughties, 
driven by um, the professional next generation consoles kicked off by PlayStation and so on. Um, and then obviously we've had another big growth phase in the late noughties and the teens driven by the first generations of smartphones and the app stores. And we think there's another growth phase happening today driven by the emergence of streaming and subscription, cross-platform, cross-game play, and um, also new technologies like VR and more importantly, AR that are coming to fruition over the next decade. Next slide. So that's why we love the sector. We are a team of 10 people. Um, I'm a games entrepreneur and I'll tell you more about that. Um, you, you probably, of course, know Ian Livingston, CBE, who's my, one of my two co-founders of the business, who's been building games companies since the mid 70s, starting with uh, White Dwarf, uh, the magazine he launched with Steve Jackson, and then um, uh, Games Workshop and Warhammer and so on. Um, and back in that era, um, you could build uh, companies worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, but it took a very long time. Next slide. Um, so Ian obviously co-founded Games Workshop. Uh, Ian and Steve launched it from the back of a van, as many of you will know, in the mid 70s. Uh, couldn't get any uh, lending from the bank to do so. And that's now a company worth um, over three billion pounds. Um, but obviously it's taken uh, 40 so years to, to travel that journey. Um, and of course, in the, in the late 80s, Ian co-founded Domark, the predecessor, a predecessor of IDOS, and then he IPO'd it as executive chairman and, and it became worth a billion in the late 90s and was subsequently sold to Square Enix. Um, uh, but both those businesses took a long time to build. Next slide. Um, more recently, um, the industry has evolved. So when we were even 15 years ago, there were 150, couple of hundred million gamers worldwide, mostly young males, mostly on uh, consoles, a uh, small number of them on PCs, almost none of them on mobiles at that point in time. Um, and they were mostly in Western Europe and the US and Japan. And obviously what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years is the iPhone has launched, the app stores have launched. We've seen this massive device rollout and adoption and also the rollout of these enormous social networks with Facebook and WeChat and so on. Um, and now we've got pushing 3 billion gamers worldwide and uh, devices in our pockets are as, happy, as, as powerful as, as the consoles of a decade ago. And you can play extraordinary games um, in billions of pockets all around the world. Um, and physical media and physical distribution, and discs and shops is going away uh, and been replaced with digital download and digital play um, and business models that were all about upfront revenue and one-offs and very hit driven and risky like the movie business have become what in investor terms uh, we often describe as consumer SaaS. So software as a service, but not with thousands of B2B enterprise customers, but with hundreds of millions or billions of consumers as customers. Um, so the industry has become huge and global and really exciting and recurring, and that's great. Next slide. Um, so now you can build huge global scale companies worth hundreds of millions or billions very quickly, often these days in less than a decade. And Ian has angel invested in a couple of uh, companies in the last decade that have traveled that journey. Uh, Playdemic, famously the founder of Golf Clash, a business that um, uh, has grown extraordinarily over the last few years. Um, in particular, and obviously in its most recent year, well, these are our estimates. These are not public data. It's not publicly released, um, but a company making, we think, huge numbers uh, under the ownership of, of Warner and, and a core anchor piece of the Warner Games division. Um, and then, of course, Mediatonic, which this year with Fall Guys has had a breakout hit. Um, again, our estimates of valuation, but um, a confidential PE round in, in, we believe, the tens of millions a couple of years ago, now a company worth 
you know, hundreds of millions, maybe even a unicorn based on the performance of four guys in particular, but with a very strong portfolio behind it. So you can build these incredibly huge companies very successfully and very quickly in a way that wasn't possible uh, 20, 30 years ago because of that global footprint. Next slide. We as an investor love that. Um, as, as a team, the hero team, there's 10 of us. We are entrepreneurs, um, the four members of the investment committee, Ian, myself, Sherry Freeman, Simon Cornwell, have built um, uh, almost $10 billion worth of companies um, that we've either founded, co-founded, or in a couple of cases, invested in um, at very early stage as angels and, and then been involved on the board or as board advisors outside the fund, prior to the fund. And many of those are extraordinary game companies. I mean, I, I started a games company which ended up in regulated uh, lottery and gambling games, but started as a mobile casual games company. We invented something called virtual sports. We were making games for Nokia's back in 2001, 2002. We eventually listed the company on AIM in London um, and then in NASDAQ in the US. And Ian obviously has traveled a similar journey with uh, a number of games companies, uh, Cherry with a number of technology companies. Um, and Simon has founded both a digital movie studio and an amazing games company called Giant Squid uh, over in LA. Uh, so we've traveled that journey. We are entrepreneurs and we wanna work with great entrepreneurs who uh, also wanna travel that journey if that's right for their business, which it isn't always, but in some cases is. Next slide. So the big question for you as a game studio, enough about us and let's focus on you, is um, is venture right for you? Um, I've given you a flavor of why as a venture investor, we're excited about the sector because of that potential to scale globally and get big fast. As a venture investor, what venture investors, whether it's us or any of the other funds um, that are excited about this space, what they're looking for is growth. And the big thing for you as a founder is, are you interested in growth? And do you have the ambition um, to take your company global? And that may not be what you're into, and it may not be right for your business or for the kind of games you're making. And it's not unequivocally a good thing. Um, some people are making beautiful games that where their interest and their focus is in the creative output or the craft of making games. And that's a wonderful thing. And that is to be applauded and valued in its own right. And if that's what you wanna do and that's all you wanna do, and you just wanna make beautiful things for a focused niche audience and pay the bills and have a nice place to live and look after your lovely team, um, that's a great path and we, we wouldn't, critique that and we would absolutely support that um, it's not necessarily the right kind of thing for a venture investor um, as an entrepreneur running a game studio it can be quite challenging um, even if you're making great games you you know it can be tough to pay the bills sometimes you're um, making games that are beginning to take off um, but you don't have the free cash flow to invest in marketing or in further parallel product development to enhance them because you've got to worry about keeping the lights on and making payroll. Um, one route in that circumstance is a publisher or a, either a deal with a publisher or a sale to a publisher. And that's a totally viable route. That, and it's a route that many people take and that's fine. Um, the challenge with that route is if you've made three games, four games at the point so you've got good early KPIs, at the point that you do a deal with a publisher and you um, sign your rights away or sell the company. Um, and then that game or the next game goes ballistic and becomes a global hit. You've left a lot of value on the table. And, and that value is partly the hero value um, of building something of that scale uh, and remaining independent, but also clearly it's the financial value of what that means for your team members and your family in terms of money that's been left on the table. So the role of a venture investor, if it is right for your business, 
is to help you um, travel the steeper bit of this curve. Um, as an investor, we will put money in on a minority basis. We don't take or pay for control of the business. We'll sit on your board and get involved and help you, but we can't tell you what to do. Um, uh, we can't hire and fire the executives. This isn't private equity. Um, we are a supportive investor um, with a minority of the business and we're there to help you grow and the business remains under your control. Um, and fundamentally, therefore, we're very selective about who we work with because we're investing in a business that you will control to a large extent. And we are looking to support you and back you to travel the steeper bit of this curve. Um, if you don't take the, the venture route, obviously you can have a great um, uh, career. You can often, there are entrepreneurs who can very successfully and have bootstrap their businesses to that kind of escape velocity growth curve without any venture funding um, because games businesses can get cash generative very quickly and all power to you. Uh, if you follow that route, that's amazing. And also um, you can clearly stay focused and choose to stay small and have a wonderful business that does great. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, so the reason to do venture is that you want, you want to accelerate your path to escape velocity um, and you want to do it with someone who's going to take a minority and help you um, but is going to put in money that gives you a little bit of breathing space um, to find the time and fund the projects to get to that escape velocity next slide so we've made uh, actually eight investments at this point but we've only gone public on, on six of them so far um, uh, three are game studios, um, including one not on this chart. Um, three are in gamified fitness, including one not on this chart. And two are in games technology, the ones in the middle. Uh, just touching on the studios in a little more detail, Polyarch and Flavorworks. Next slide. Um, uh, well, you, you'll see on this slide quotes from um, the founder of uh, Flavorworks and the founder of Polyarch. Um, I'll just read out the, the Polyarch. I mean, this is a very successful, in this case, Seattle-based studio. Flavorworks is a London-based studio. Um, uh, and there, there's Tam from Polyarch. We spent the last few years speaking with a wide variety of investors. In these conversations, we inevitably discussed the value that Polyarch's building as a studio. Ultimately, we believe the greatest long-term value that we build as a game company is our intellectual property, our characters and our worlds, which represent an emotional connection with our players. Hero is one of the few investors with a real appreciation for this long view. Um, you can also see Jack there talking about us helping them on scaling, strategic planning and business development. So the point about putting these in, um, the chart is helping you understand that venture investors are not just gray suits. We're not all and only accountants. We do have one accountant in our team of 10 and he's a great um, insightful, thoughtful person who helps our businesses um, with the numbers side of what they do. But as an investor, we and, and the other good games funds focused on this space are generally focused on product first and people first. We're interested in, are you making great games? And are you a strong, compelling team that has a vision for where you want to take your business? And that's what we look at first. Um, that's probably maybe different from later stage funds, um, maybe different from the more generalists that are a little bit less focused on games. But our focus is your gameplay mechanics um, and the quality of your team. Next slide. Um, so Polyarch um, uh, is this amazing studio based in Seattle, um, and uh, they happen to have made games in the first in their first iterations that are focused on VR, and they innovate in VR. And when they started, VR was a small market, but they still managed to make eight million dollars of uh, sorry eight figures uh, million you know, figures of revenue. Um, so north of $10 million of revenue from uh, VR over the last uh, couple of years. Next slide. Um, and um, 
This is a quote um, from the CEO, um, or a quote that the CEO of Polyart used in, in his description um, of their theory and approach. Um, a game delay is temporary, a bad game is for, forever. As a team, we back them um, and back them and continue to back them because they're extraordinarily focused on making really beautiful, compelling games with really deep characters and strong gameplay. Um, and we believe as, a, as an investor, our thesis is, look, they're doing really well in VR and there's good IP uh, creation in there and good revenue momentum. But the strength of those characters is such that they can carry those characters and those worlds across multiple generations of that game and from VR into other platforms um, and build a, a, a large global franchise um, based on the strength of their fundamental gameplay. Next slide. Um, interestingly, Flavorworks, um, a great studio, slightly earlier stage investment based in, in central London. Um, Jack and Pavley, great team. Next slide. Um, uh, the innovation there, I mean, they've launched their first game and it's performed well um, on, on Sony and now just launching on mobile. So similar thesis of taking a core game and, and pushing it cross platform. But obviously they have innovated a really interesting new deep touch interactivity on branching narrative uh, games um, with full motion video. So that idea of taking um, a, an established category but creating a radical innovation in it um, and bringing uh, the world of movies and TV together with the world of games is a really, really strong innovation that we, that we applaud. And we think that has real extension and applicability across a wide addressable market. Next slide. So the reason to focus on those two as examples of the kind of things we're investing in. Also Live, uh, Live is a, a streaming platform um, for uh, content creators who want to stream games in VR um, into uh, platforms like 2D platforms like Twitch um, and YouTube. Uh, next slide. Um, their core mission is working with game studios. They've now integrated hundreds of games from hundreds of studios, including some of the biggest in VR. They've got a huge strong share in the space and they're bringing together studios and uh, streamer creators uh, onto the big streaming platforms and putting them, enabling them to speak to their audiences. So what we like about all three of those businesses, next slide, is a mix of factors. Um, I'll come on to the three factors in a second, um, but just to repeat, um, we've made three game studio investments at this point. We will make another 10 to 12 um, over the next few months. Uh, by the end of next year, 2021, we'll have made probably a total of 15 investments, maybe a couple of more in-game studios. Um, and we'll be deploying another 40 to $60 million into those studios to help them grow and to help accelerate their growth. In terms of studios, um, we are content and platform agnostic. We've made one VR studio investment, one mobile studio investment, one PC and mobile studio investment. Um, but uh, so we are platform agnostic, but we like studios which are creating IP and, and tech that can ultimately medium term go cross platform um, uh, that ideally not necessarily have or can have multiplayer and social components um, um, that can address a large uh, demographic audience um, and, and have multi-country or global scape, scope. Uh, we normally invest fairly early in the life of a business, so usually post-seed, but not always. So we're coming in at a point when you've got a product or a technology or a game that we can do diligence um, and you've got maybe some early KPIs through to a later stage where you've got a few million a year, maybe just north of 10 million a year, up to that kind of range um, of revenue. So we can go later, we can go earlier, but usually you're at somewhere between half a million and 10 million of revenue, and you've got games that we can look at and due diligence and get excited about. Next slide. Um, 
ultimately what we're looking for is hundreds of factors but it boils down to these three big things um do we like you and do you like us as people uh when we invest or when you take venture investment from us or, or anybody else uh it's kind of like a marriage you're going to be working together for a few years you're not going to see each other every day you're probably going to talk every couple of weeks and, and sit on a board every couple of months together and hopefully get some support on specific projects, biz dev or tech projects from specialists in the team. But you are going to be seeing each other for a fair amount for a, a number of years. Um, so you've got to like each other. Uh, and we're, we are looking for games founders who have vision and ambition and want to build something big, um, who are resilient, can deal with problems and challenges because building a business is basically a veil of tears. It's an amazing heroic enterprise, but it's exhausting and it's countless problems. And we, we, we want to see you solving those problems uh, and we want to help you solve those problems. Um, and fundamentally, in a game studio, we're looking for a, what we call a deep moat, which is kind of deep defensibility in the business. And in a studio, that comes down to, is it a great game? That means, is the gameplay mechanic compelling? Uh, is it easy to get excited by and when we will play the games a lot um we will look at the steam reviews or the app store reviews we will typically go out and, and do a panel test with different types of players from the relevant demographics and get their independent feedback um and we'll play it a lot ourselves and, and decide whether we we love it as much as we love you um and you know then we're obviously we're interested in the kpis and and the stats and how you think about those and and so on and how thoughtful you are about where you want to take the game and your roadmap um and then the final thing is you can have a really great experience team um um making a really exciting game that we really like but sometimes it can just be targeting a market that is way too niche so we do sometimes see really great teams with really great games that are just doing something far too hardcore um doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do but it means it's difficult to invest in as a venture investor um something focused for something or something very culturally focused on a very specific country or mythology that that doesn't have much pickup um internationally um or something that's a kind of particular game genre which isn't particularly hardcore but is still um played only by a very small number of people worldwide it's a particular um, and we've had lots of examples not lots of examples but a few examples where we we fall in love with a team we love the game but we just look at it and we go we can't ever see this getting big um so sometimes we'll go back we tr usually try and go back with very direct feedback where we pass on something um, and explain why. Um, and sometimes the entrepreneur finds that that feedback useful um, and it makes them think about well, if they're doing all these things right, but they're targeting a tiny market, maybe they should target a slightly larger market. Um, so why do we care about these things? And in particular, why do we care about that left latter? We as investors have a responsibility. We uh, are investing our own money in the fund, but we're also investing um money from um a bunch of third party investors and professional investors and they're looking for us to get a return on that and we get that return by finding amazing entrepreneurs and backing them um and putting money into them at you know to be frank an initial valuation that can't be too high otherwise we can't get them a return uh, so we'll always try and pay the right price for a business that's not too low because it's not in our interests um, to um, exploit the entrepreneur. We're backing the entrepreneur, but it also can't be crazy high because otherwise we can't get a return for our investors. Then we work with you over a number of years as you grow the business and as the revenues grow and the top line grows and the customers are acquired and your footprint goes from local to global, um, then we will work with you to get the best possible exit. And that might be a sale to a big publisher or it might be an IPO in London or New York, as we did with our own businesses. Um, either of those routes are great. And on those, on, on those routes, uh, when it's successful, um, yes, 
we as a fund make a great return for our investors, but hand in hand, our interests are aligned. You as entrepreneurs make great returns for having built something beautiful and big. Next slide. So I'm drawing to a close now. Um, that's how we think about the world. Um, we, um, Hero Capital is called Hero Capital for three reasons. Um, we, when you start and launch a business, you are a hero. Um, when you play a game, um, you're a hero uh, of that game or of that sport. Um, and Hero Capital is also a kind of dog whistle reference to the way it's spelled, H-I-R-O, to Hero Protagonist, who's the game playing hacker hero of uh, Neil Stevenson's uh, sci-fi book, Snow Crash from the early 90s. Um, we are geeky about games. Um, Snow Crash is the um, book that introduced the concept of the metaverse. Um, we like the games industry because we love games, but also we think uh, games are building this big new future of human to human social interaction, um, which people are now calling the metaverse, thanks to Stevenson. Um, so we are games geeks and sci-fi geeks. Um, we're also entrepreneurs who've traveled the journey from two people in a room with an idea to hundreds of employees or thousands and um, public listings. And we really care about gameplay and we really care about storytelling. Ian is of course a, a writer as well as a game designer. Um, I, I and C Stephen are the sons of famous writers and, and in one case gamers. Um, and we really care about the narrative and storytelling side of creating games, as well as the business and financial side of creating games businesses. Next slide. Um, so that's us um, and how we think about investing in game studios and how we think about interacting with creators like yourself. Um, and venture may not be right for you. Um, and that doesn't mean you're not building a wonderful thing and a wonderful business. It's just uh, venture looks for certain characteristics um, and not all games companies have those or need to have those. Um, but if it is right for you and you're in enthused by what you've heard today, please come and talk to us. Uh, the deets are on the slide in front of you. You can Google us. Um, but equally, there are other great funds in and around the space um, and we're enthusiastic and passionate about the space and of course you are too and uh, be great to hear from you uh, thanks very much